Here in the Northern Rockies, dark winter months are outlasted in basements, dens, and nooks, where kindred souls gather together to share intel, swap fly patterns, and relive the memories from seasons past. This gathering spot known locally as the February Room is the inspiration for this podcast. No matter the season, the door is always open to those with a fly fishing story to tell. Brought to you by CD Fishing USA, the North American distributor for composite development fly rods and accessories. 40 years of Kiwi ingenuity and graphite technology now available at cd-fishing.us or your local CD USA dealer. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. And remember to go fishing. Here's your host, the Carnops, and this is the February Room. Today, I am honored to be joined by a renowned Montana guide. Uh, for nearly 30 years, he and his wife have operated a fishing and hunting operation in northwest Montana, where they have earned Orvis endorsements and uh, Montana Guide of the Year honors and developed a long list of clients and friends throughout the industry. Tim Linehan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Well, we appreciate you taking the time today. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, you've been at this guiding thing for about uh, three decades now, so uh, I know you have a good fishing story or two you can share with us. Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't, um, you know, it's interesting, Justin, um, as you well know, every day is different out there, but, uh, you know, sometimes it's hilarious and sometimes it's serious and sometimes, um, you know, there's a range of emotions and experiences during the course of the day that, that uh, you know, that can be so varied your head spins. But I, you know, <laughs> when somebody asks me that question, I've been super fortunate all these years. I mean, I really don't have an incident where I ended up with someone who was so rude and so mean and so nasty that I couldn't wait for the day to be over. Um, you know, as you know, lots of our colleagues do have stories like that, but I don't know. I've just been super lucky. I mean, I've had some long days where, yeah, you know, okay, let's let's make this work, and I'm gonna, you know, break this person down with kindness and make and sm make them smile in spite of maybe they're having a bad day. But I've never really felt like I needed to, you know, jump off the boat and run, run for the woods and get the heck away. But <laughs> having said that, having said that. Um, so, so one of the, but what I do enjoy are those funny moments and, and, and maybe, uh, you know, maybe that's what sticks in my mind most, but, uh, this, you know, we get all shapes and sizes, as you well know. And what amazes me is, uh, how we're all different, how, 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 how you can have a great athlete. I mean, you can get a triathlete or you can get someone who's particularly athletic, but it takes them all day to learn how to really make a nice cast. And you can get someone who is not particularly athletic and in five and a half minutes, uh, mostly because they listen, they, um, they, they learn how to cast very quickly. So, but I had a, there's a, immediately, <laughs> I, an experience comes to mind. I had a lovely, lovely woman uh, this was this was a number of years ago, and and it was just difficult for her. Uh, usually, women learn faster because they listen better, but for whatever reasons, she just kind of couldn't put it together. And but I was determined, and she was even more determined. And we were going to get a decent cast, and we were going to get a fish on a dry fly. About halfway through the day, she still, uh, you know, just doesn't quite have it. <laughs> you really can't put it together, and it's. I'm starting to think, man, I thought I was a decent instructor after all these years, but I'm doubting myself, Justin, because I sure. can't even, it's not even off the oar yet, right? Her fly, <laughs> I can't even get it off the side of the boat, uh, but she's still working at it. We hit a decent riffle and I think, okay, if, <laughs> if it's going to happen, it's going to happen here. And I'm swinging, uh, now I'm just swinging an elk hair caddis, right? It's not really much of a cast, but I'm, you know, she's getting it out there and I'm pulling back on the boat so that the, you know, the, obviously the fly swings out ahead a little bit. And there's some caddis coming on off and, and I'm thinking, you know, this could work. You know, maybe something will just, you know, run up and hang itself on, <laughs> on her little caddis. She's swinging away, swinging away. At about, I'm ready to start making adjustments yet again. She's going back way too far with her back cast, and she's swinging away. And the next thing I know, a fly hits the water on the back cast, literally off the oar, right off the oar. It hits the water behind us. 
and she starts to forward cast, and sure, sure, sure as the dickens, she's got about a 10-inch trout on there. And that thing flew over our head and went about 35 <laughs> feet. the best cast she made all day. <laughs> With a 10-inch trout on the fly from her back cast. So <laughs> I don't, it's the first and only time I've seen that. Um, Part of me hopes I see it again <laughs> because she thought it was more hilarious and more outstanding than I did. And it was a, a wonderful, it was the only fish she caught all day. <laughs> anyway. Oh, that's great. So she had a, she had a positive reaction to it. That's she awesome. sure did. She sure did. In her, in her mind, she caught a fish. <laughs> Yeah, that's she got all she cared on, about. She got one on a fly, right? Exactly. <laughs> right. Well, well, she, you know, she achieved a rare feat. Um, I can't say I've ever done that myself. So that's, I, well, I did, I did, uh, yeah, no, not definitely not with a trout. So. Yeah. Well, you know, it was wonderful. She never gave up, and isn't that the most fun in in what we do? Sometimes people people are people are wonderful, and they're. Days like that are so fun. She wasn't going to give up, and it wasn't like anybody. Uh, nobody really got frustrated. I wouldn't say that, but but uh, you know, she never quit smiling, never quit laughing, and uh, you know, by the end of the day, our our faces were hurting. We had been laughing so much, and that's what it's about. In the end, I, I find it necessary to remind myself, uh, but I also find it necessary to remind some people who's you know some guests that can be particularly serious that in the end, this is supposed to be fun. That's why we do. That's why we're on the water doing what we do. Keep in mind that, yeah, everybody wants big fish. Yeah, everybody wants a bunch of fish. Yeah, 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 yeah. But really, this is supposed to be fun. That's what it's supposed to be. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's the most important thing, too, like you mentioned, from a from a guide's perspective, to remember that. And, and you know, that's something that uh, when, when I guide, I, I've, I've had three stints. I'm in my third stint now as as a fly fishing guide <laughs> and, and in my 20s um i was i was way too uh high strung and immature to really be an effective guide i mean i was you know i could row the boat and i i could i could i knew how to catch fish i don't think i was very good at always portraying um that tactic uh to the clients um and I just, you know, I, I, looking back, I wasn't patient enough and I forgot that this is really supposed to be fun. And, um, and now, you know, that I'm older and I've been and on my third stint, as I mentioned it, um, that's something that I really, uh, you know, you have to just wake up kind of with that attitude, like, Hey, we're going to go out and we're going to have fun today, no matter what happens. And I'm not going to get stressed out if the fish is not great. Cause that's out of my control. And we're going to tell some stories and laugh and, and, get to know each other and, and, uh, you know, and, and give her hell. No, that's perfect. That's that you just summed it up. That's, that's a, that's a, that's a succinct and articulate, um, point of view. Uh, it's, it's tricky sometimes. I, there are days when I still take it home, but, um, you know, yeah, anyway, it's, it's supposed to be fun and <laughs> that's the most important thing. <laughs> well, yeah. And, you know, sometimes you get these, these, surprising rewards from guiding um for example yesterday this box showed up at my house and i opened it up i, I saw the name and uh, i recognized the name it was a guy that i took fishing this summer for a couple of days and uh he was a really nice guy he was a former division one football player and he was a big guy he was you know well over 300 um and uh yeah, he was a big fella, uh, you know, uh, and he was athletic. He was a tarpon fisherman from Texas and uh, he had never trout fished before. And his his buddies had been coming out here for a long time with with the outfitter that, that we were working that I was guiding for. And um, and so they were they were all, you know, well versed in trout fishing. And uh, and it was a really humbling experience for him, you know, because he could cast but he did not uh, have the nuances for trout fishing and he broke off a ton of flies and he broke off you know most of the fish that he hooked he he either missed or you know ate his <laughs> right. bug. he either missed him or broke him, and he just struggled right but but he sent me this picture that he painted from he had snapped a photo and it was the confluence of the clark fork and the flathead and he sent me this incredible watercolor and uh you know i was like holy cow how amazing is that yeah so that was an yeah. unexpected reward from guiding and those those yeah, yeah. pop up 
those are the great moments, right? Those are the great moments. I mean, there's a guy that no matter what happened, no matter how the day went, he thought enough of you. He must have thought an awful lot of you, which doesn't surprise me. But, uh, you know, to take the time to do something like that. Um, indeed, those are the bonuses. Absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, extremely kind of him. Um, yeah, you yeah. Tim, you guide throughout uh, throughout the waters of of Montana, Western Montana, at least. I know I've I've seen your boat uh, several different several different locations over the years. Um, but your home water is kind of the Kootenai, correct? Yep, correct. So I I really don't know much about the Kootenai. I've only floated it one time. Can you kind of describe that river for us? Kind of paint us a paint us a watercolor of it, if you will. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's a little different up here. Well, it's not so much different from where you guys are, but, um, you know, for most people, you know, we talk about Montana being big sky country, uh, rolling hills and open, you know, open sort of foothills and then, you know, the mountain range 50 miles in the distance, right? We're a little different up here. This is much more like the Pacific Northwest up here. Um, and it smells like Christmas every day and it's lush and thick and heavily timbered. Uh, so the Kootenai is a huge river. Um, it's big and it's broad. It's a tailwater fishery, as you know, Justin, which means it's below a dam. Uh, it's, boy, at its narrowest, it's still a hundred. There are a couple places where it gets neck down and we get some, you know, big standing waves. And um, But for the most part, it's, you know, three, two or three, two and a half, three hundred yards wide. And it has that typical tailwater smell and feel to it. Um, but the nice thing about up here is, uh, you know, we always have cold water and, and, and this, this always gets a little tricky because there are places around the state right now that are, um, you know, later in the season, they start to get low and slow and a little bit warm. But, but the nice thing is, you know, being a tailwater, we always have 56 degree water temps coming out. But it's a, it's a, I would call it a muscle river. I mean, it's a big river. You know, it's not, a, it's not you know, most of the rivers in the state are, are, are an eighth the size or maybe a quarter the size of the, of the Kootenai. So it's a drift boat fishery. Um, it, it, um, it fishes really well all year actually uh, pretty decent hatches it, it's not um, you know average bread and butter rainbows 12 to 14 inches it's a drift boat fishery by and large there is some waiting uh, flows are nice and stable that's the nice thing during the season actually we you know we come off a of spring runoff when the river is 25 26 27 thousand cubic feet per second which is a you know which is a big brawling mussel river uh, but by about the third week of July a uh, third week of June maybe the first of July we come down to steady flows and it's you know somewhere between depending on how much snowpack right depending on how full the reservoir is we get steady flows somewhere in the range of like 7,000 to 12,000 which is lovely perfect you know what I mean still that's yeah, a lot of that's water a right? big river yeah 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 right <laughs> I know you compare that to let's say the Missouri right I mean you know we hope for 5,000 on the Missouri but uh, at any rate um, but but it can handle it it fishes differently to that end because it's you know it's big and it's broad but um, you know, bread and butter, as I mentioned, 12 to 14 inch rainbows with some, you know, bigger fish thrown in. But that's just, you know, after all these years, I'm just super honest. And we fish, we consider it a dry fly fishery. Uh, I would say we fish dry flies 75% of the time once the water temps get up to around that 56, 58 degrees. And um, all the major hatches, Justin, you know, we start with PMDs and caddis and those will roll through, you know, like everywhere else, generally speaking, they'll roll into early September. Um, and then we're, you know, throwing terrestrials and then in between all that, you can nymph, you can pull streamers. Um, all the native species that were here, uh, so these are a native strain of rainbows. These were actually here. These are, these are um, red band, inland red band rainbows. They're a little hybridized at this point, but, you know, they could be considered the only native rainbows in the, in the, um, in the Rocky Mountain West. And then we also have bull trout and whitefish, a few brown trout in the lower river, but not really many. We might see a brown trout a week. So, but super, super interesting. A little less crowded up here is the other nice thing. Um, but by and large, it's a big river, it's a drift boat fishery, um, but it's a great dry fly fishery, and that's pretty much what we love to do. Um, and there are some, that river harbors some giant fish, right? There's it, yeah. There's been some yeah, huge, huge trout caught in, in the Kootenai over the years. Where where are those fish hiding at, and, and do you ever see those? 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so I kind of, you know, the, it, these days for the average angler, I'm, as I said, I'm just pretty straight about, you know, bread and butter, 12 to 14 or 12 to 15 um, on a dry fly. Now, if you want to pull junk on the Kootenai River, you could get a wallop of a surprise, right? So the state record came out right from below the Libby Dam, and I can't even remember, but I think it's a 32 pound rainbow. Looks like a king or something. You know what I mean? It's just huge. Yeah. Is and that they a red are, band? They are, yeah, yeah. Holy yep. cow. I know, wow. I know, right, I know. And and it's interestingly enough, um, they're up there, Justin. They're up there. But I often, you know, and, and, and boy, that's fun. I mean, we, we, you know, periodically throughout the season, I'll get somebody and all they want to do is throw junk, throw big stuff on a sinking tip up there. And the top three miles, actually, you know what I mean? If they're, of course, they're right below the dam, but the top three miles... Those big fish seem to migrate and spend most of their time up in the top three miles of the river. Um, but 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 periodically we'll you know we'll you know we'll go up there and just concentrate and spend all day throwing junk up there. And you know I often tell people it's kind of the steelhead thing. You're a good soldier. You're just going to keep doing the drill. And if and when you get it right, it could be it could be a five to let's just say you know five to fifteen pound rainbow but but um but you know again the reality of that is you know i've been up there for hundreds and hundreds of hours and i could count the number of mm, seven pound plus rainbows we've caught you know what i mean so it's so it's kind of it's kind of it's it's just that thing but but they're there and we get them and if somebody wants to do it and somebody wants to give it three days you'll probably you'll probably get a pretty good tug whether you land them or not that's a you know that's always subject to a million different things but but yeah so it's, it's, it's an interesting fishery like that there are some of the biggest rainbows in the state but bread and butter would would be right in that you know 12 to 15 inch range on a day-to-day -day basis with an average guest yeah well, I'll take those odds. Um, there's yeah, not, yeah. you know, around here, if you <laughs> yeah, fish for a water. week, yeah. if you fish for a week, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell you that you have a chance of encountering a seven pound rainbow anywhere on the rivers around <laughs> right. here. Yeah. And, you know, the, and, other, the, other, the other big fish too, and, and we, we don't target them. This isn't a wink, wink, you know what I mean? But we also have bull trout and, and, and the bullies are way more user-friendly in so far as we get big bullies all the time. You know what I mean? You pull a streamer on the Kootenai for a few hours uh, when the conditions are right, and, you know, that that's 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 a better opportunity for a five-plus-pound trout. Yeah, you know, even right. the yeah. Well, and not to not to besmirch, those 12 to 15-inch red bands are incredible fish. I mean, that's... Yeah, they are. You know, that's, yeah. Super energetic, yeah. Yeah, they are. Those are... As far as trout go, hard to beat. That's basically what uh, you know. A river like the Deschutes kind of boasts the same thing. I mean, yeah, there's right. those those twelve to fifteen inch fish get, as you kind of alluded to, they get exaggerated to fifteen to eighteen inches all the time because they out <laughs> they outfight their proportions. Not only are fishermen liars, but uh, they yeah. definitely <laughs> outfight their proportions. They're like, there's no way that thirteen inch rainbow just you know, got me into my backing. It couldn't have been yeah. that small, but they're yeah. just, those are, those fish are built for power. They're, yeah, like you mentioned, they're native fish and they grew up, uh, you know, I, it, at one point they may, they were probably attached to the Pacific, but, um, you know, they have, uh, they've been engineered to battle big rivers and heavy water and they're just all muscle. That's exactly right. Yep, that's exactly right. And indeed, they were attached to the Pacific, right? So these inland red band rainbows, there are still native, uh, I'm sorry, there are still pure inland red band rainbows in the headwaters of some of the tributaries of the Kootenai, uh, which is really fun. Like we use little one-way rods. Ooh, cool. Yeah, yeah, super fun, right? But, you know, they're, they're gonna, they'll fit in the palm of your hand. They're like a little... A little jewel or something, you know what I mean. But having said that, to your point, you're absolutely right. These these inland red band rainbows used were steelhead. They got you know shut off from the last glacial ice age and some changes in the environment. And but now they're up here. But um, but to your point, they live in big water here on the Kootenai. They live in big current all year. And uh, and uh, I often tell people, uh, oh, unlike s not not good, bad, or otherwise, but you know sometimes you catch a you catch a nice thick brown around the state, and you would you would call it you know, uh, 
not necessarily fat, but they're, but, but they're a little softer. These things are as tight as your fist. Maybe that's the way to look at it. You know what I mean? They're just, they're, they're, they're built for, they're, they're sitting in big current all year, 24 hours a day, you know, 12 months a year. Yeah. 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 They're incredible, incredible fish. How many days on the, on the water are you, uh, are you still out there? Are you, are you doing, you know, 80 days still, or how many days do you actually guide? Yeah, no, heck, uh, wow. I, um, I'm still, uh, I still approach 180 days guiding Holy every year, God. but wow. that, but that includes, but that includes hunting. So I'll back off. I'll still do 120 or plus fishing, Justin. So, um, you mentioned earlier, I, I love the I love the springtime. I love it all, but I still love the springtime because it gets me, you know, you can do the, that nomadic thing and I'll spend some time down around Missoula on the Clark Fork and the Bitterroot. And then I spend most of May and the first two weeks of June over on the Missouri. Um, so I get started usually around the, you know, third week of March. And it's not every day, but, you know, you start the third week of March and boy, by the time July rolls around, you already got 50 or 60 days under your belt. So still do probably 100 plus 110 or 20 fishing days and then throw in some you know throw in a bunch of hunting and yeah maybe 150 days a year something like that wow that's a lot that's impressive and you still um in the face of of all those work days you still have not lost your love of fishing no you know i really haven't lost my passion and it's interesting you know as 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 you well know you, you you um Oh, whatever you do. I guess it doesn't matter if you're selling refrigerators for a living or whatever. You know, there, there, there are years, or let's just say there are periods of time when you're, you're all fired up and every day is, is, is an adventure. And, uh, and then there are times when, you know, your head's in a different place for whatever reasons and, 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 and you're, you know, maybe you're tired, but, but, those, but those are just normal, right? And particularly when you own your own business, those are just normal um, emotions that I think go along with with any any occupation. But having said that, I I I, I may be as hot to to actually fish or work, I guess, than 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 I have been. I mean, on one level, I I I, I love it more. I think uh, we talked earlier about not taking it home with you at night if you don't get people into a bunch of fish. I, I think I've arrived at that place, uh, or I'm arriving, <laughs> getting closer to that place, and I'm just trying to be, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying it more because I think I'm more in the moment. I'm, I'm really, really enjoying return clients, some of them for, you know, approaching 25, 26 years now. And, so I'm just as hot as I was lately, the last few years, as I have been in many years, and uh, and and it's fun. It's just it's really fun. I mean, that is the word I would use. I I still really enjoy it. I think in my case, I have a busy head. Uh, that's another conversation for another time. Yeah. But <laughs> clinically, I would say I'm ADHD. So sure. you know, the, only, the only time my mind is quiet is when I'm on the water or in the woods, and, and, and maybe that's the other reason why I've never really lost the, the drive to be out there, because otherwise my I got a lot of noise in my head. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hear you. Um, but I still love it. Yeah, I still love it, and I'm, I'm, um, I'm hanging in there, as they say. <laughs> well, that's awesome. And, you know, when you've been doing it as long as you have, and, you know, another guy that kind of reiterates what you said, is a, a, a younger outfitter here by the name of Peter Skidmore, who you know. Um, oh yeah, and you yeah. know he just has a good attitude all the time. And I'm like, Peter, how can you be? How can you be this stoked about guiding every day? He's like, <laughs> well, at this point, I'm fishing with my friends. Like it's yeah. it's that's my job. Like these are my friends now. My clients are my buddies. And yeah, and uh, you know, I'm I'm going fishing with my friends for a living. Does it get any better than that? And, uh, no. Yeah, yeah, that's that's wonderful. It doesn't. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he he is the real deal, man. Skitty is the real deal. Yeah. Yeah, he's solid. Um, yeah. How do you and how do you and Joanne juggle the business? What's her role? Um, and yeah, can you get into that a little bit? Yeah, you guys no, are a family I, I, operation. Yeah, I really appreciate you asking because without 
any exception. I don't even have to think twice of this, that, you know, Joanne is Linehan Outfitting. I mean, yeah, maybe I'm the face because I'm the guy that's on the water and people see the logo on the boat and maybe I'm the one that does the blogs and, you know, social, but that's just the business end. But, 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 you know, without, without a moment's hesitation, Joanne is Linehan Outfitting. Um, it's tricky. It's tricky, as you well know. Again, we have a lot of similarities. <laughs> it's, right. it's it's very it's, it can be very difficult to to be in business with your spouse or your partner. And um, sure. we, we we have been super super fortunate. But but when I say that she is Linehan Outfitting, I would say that um, you know she's the foundation. You know she really is. She does she does the books. She does sales. She does. You know, she does everything from the bottom up. Uh, she's, you know, a wonderful, extraordinary chef. Um, she logs miles in the, you know, in the in the in the uh, in the truck every day. She preps here at the house, and then she drives down to Libby, which for us is a winding, narrow mountain pass, about 45 minutes from where we live here in the Yak Valley. Uh, she she meets and greets and does the meals and drives home at 11 p.m. and so. You know, she's really uh, throws in sales, throws in two hours of sales and desk work each morning, every day during the season. Um, loves to get after it herself, but but uh, you know, she she pretty much handles the business end of Linehan Outfitting and more. I would say that's pretty pretty much. Imagine doing everything, Justin, and uh, probably pretty much the same thing Lauren does, really. <laughs> right, right, and then and, and everybody probably likes her a little more than you as well. Yeah, yeah. If, it's, if it's the same as my <laughs> right. my operation, <laughs> like, hey, yeah. like why why don't I get to talk to Lauren? I'm like, well, sorry, <laughs> man, you, you drew the short end of the stick today. Right, uh, right, right. I mean, I'm answering the phone. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and, and you guys have accommodations up there for your guests um, as well, right? Or do you guys put yeah. Your, yeah that's you guys have lodging in the whole nine yards we do have lodging we do have full packages and we we decided you know i guess there's two models um in this business or you know maybe there's two models but you know a lot of times when you get started you start a little shop and 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 do the retail thing and run guides out of the shop uh and or you go the other route some people do all three justin but we just decided that we would do lodging and run guides, and so we have two lodging options. We live in this little place called Yak, and we have standalone little log cabins up here, um, custom made. Joanne and I peeled the logs and um, did oh, as much wow. as we could. Yeah, yeah, it was super fun. Um, we we do most of our we have we have fishing clients, bird hunting clients, and we do all of our hunting primarily out of this out of our Yak location. We also live right here on the Yak property. And then we have a lodge down on the banks of the Kootenai, and um, the lodge is full service. The cabins are kind of standalone, full kitchens, full, you know, full, you know, full everything. So folks do it's sort of that, um, uh, you know, do your own meals, accepting lunch, which we cover with the, you know, with the guides. But so, you know, clients do their own meals when they're at the cabins, but we also have the lodge down in Libby. Uh, six to eight people and Joanne does all the you know all the meals does the you know does the the chef thing and meets and greets it you know when people get back off the river so um, we have two options and they both yeah they they kind of they work really well together uh, they're obviously different price points as well so that that makes things nice we offer a variety of packages and that has served us well I mean sometimes we think we should simplify things and you know have a straight rate but it's nice. I think it has. Anyway, I'm getting a little busy with the business, but it's served us well to have two options with two different price points. Yeah. And then will you tell me a little about your uh, your hunting um, operation. You guys do some kind of unique stuff. There's not you you offer wild grouse hunts, correct? We yeah yeah absolutely. So so I've got three uh, English setters lying here at my feet, and and uh, forgive <laughs> the interruptions because somebody always wants to go out. Um, sure. But uh, yeah, so we have a full hunting operation. I mean, on one level, uh, I don't mean this good, bad, or otherwise, but kind of old school. Like 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 you know, as you well know, a lot of our colleagues these days are either fishing or hunting. Um, but but we still do it all, and we so we we've got the full fly fishing program that runs, you know, sort of maybe day to day into the middle of October. And then um, starting about the middle of September, I'll start running the dogs. And we offer some, 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 as far as I'm concerned, some pretty solid 
wild grouse hunting. We've got three species up here. These are called, you know, they call them commonly called forest grouse out here in the, you know, in the west. But we've got spruce grouse, ruffed grouse, and blue grouse. And so I'll start running my dogs. Uh, I do about 30 straight days, mid-September to mid-October, myself and one other guide. And then we have a full big game operation that starts around the end of September as well. So we'll we'll do some archery hunting uh, that time of year. And then, but the bulk of our season is, you know, the deer elk season, the rifle season throughout the entire month of November. And then we'll throw in some sheep hunts once in a while. We usually get a moose hunt every year. Once in a while, a lion hunt, um, but yeah, but we're kind of all over the map, and we love every minute of it. I, I, it, you know, works well for me. You were you going back a moment ago. You were, you know, you asked, uh, you know, how is it that I'm still excited about each day? I think for me it works really well because <coughs> right about when I'm sorry, Justin, right about when I'm kind of ready to get out of the boat, it's time to get into the woods. And so I think that's why I still have passion for all this is because my schedule allows me to do a variety of things throughout the season. I don't know that I could do 150 or 60 straight days of fishing. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not really certain I could, to be honest with you. Right, yeah, well, yeah, and that's a pretty diverse operation and you're jumping around like you mentioned. You're coming, you know, you're going out to do some some squala fishing uh, on the Clark Fork and then you're heading over to the Missouri and then you're on the Kootenai and then and then, uh, and then you have the hunting operation too. So that, uh, yeah, that diversity um, makes the whole, the whole profession more interesting for sure. It, it works well for me. It may, may, and maybe, maybe, um, maybe it worked. Maybe that's part of my ADHD. Too. <laughs> I oh, I'm with you. I, I am with you <laughs> right there. Yeah. Well, and that's, it's, there's not, you know, too many outfitters around here that I know of that offer, uh, you know, wild forest grouse hunting. And, um, I, I imagine that you get, uh, quite a bit of crossover from fly fishing clients who who come out and participate in that particular activity with you because it's so popular with folks in the east and the mid upper midwest and everything and they are just usually blown away when they see actually how many birds there are around here that's a that's a really good point yeah and, and actually you know you're absolutely right uh it is i get a lot of guests from that sort of traditional rough grouse country uh northeast midwest and and um you know, those guys are experienced and it's super fun because, um, you know, wild birds is tricky. You know, there's only so many of them and they're, they're you know, populations are subject to mostly the springtime breeding conditions. And so it, it can be, it can be, um, you know, it can be challenging some years and wonderful other years. But by and large, you know, I think because we, not, not I think, because we have so much available habitat, and, and, and as you well know, habitat is everything, we always have, even a fair year here is a pretty good year in a lot of other places, you know what I mean? So, Right, yeah. Um, and so how do you guys spend your off-season other than, you know, I'm sure you do a few shows. Um, are, you, are you and Joanne skiers, or do you travel to some saltwater destination and go get some vitamin D? Yeah, a little bit of both, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we sure love to get out. Like, we love to snowshoe, love to cross-country ski. Um, yeah, and then we also do love to go saltwater, like, a, like, a, you know, like you guys and a fair number of our colleagues. That's a wonderful way to get away. And typically we will, oh boy, we were doing it every year, but, you know, COVID kind of changed that a little bit. But we typically take a, you know, a group of friends slash guests down somewhere, you know what I mean, make it that busman's holiday and head down to Belize or the Bahamas or something like that and um, sure really really enjoy that Joanne's caught as many permit as anybody I know she's, she's is that uh, right <laughs> well, she's nuts for it nuts for it Justin yeah I'll say oh hey, that's you know, cool yeah you want to go weigh the flats at all and just you know stick some bonefish no let's just go hunt permit <laughs> she's a permit junkie she's, huh she loves it, yeah. She loves it, just loves it. She could stand on the bow and look all day, and if she sees one and gets a crack, her day is made, yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, those those saltwater trips right now, as the snow is piling up, and it, it finally <laughs> feels like winter here, though, which is good. Like, it's cold, and, and uh, you know, it was a little eerie when it was 70 degrees on December 1st and the Madison went dry. So wow, the world crazy. the world feels a little more normal right now, but I am definitely itching to go get into some salt water right now myself. 
Yeah, us too. Yeah, it would be a little later in the year, but we're gonna we're determined to get somewhere this year. Yeah. Well, Tim, um, where can folks go to learn more about uh, Linehan Outfitting and yeah, uh, your, your the guide trips you offer? Yep. So we've got it. Well, obviously, we've got a we've got a you know a nice site. Just launched a. Um, a huge facelift last, uh, I, I guess we finally went live in June or something like that. Spent a lot of the winter building it, Justin, so that's satisfying. Um, I am, we are fishmontana.com, so that's easy enough. And then, uh, you know, from the contact page, you can obviously find our phone number and uh, Instagram and Facebook and everything else. But Linehan Outfitting is company name and uh, fishmontana.com is our website and we're located uh, up here in northwest Montana and I guess you could call this Kootenai River country. This is the Kootenai National Forest and the Kootenai River runs right through the middle of it. Well beautiful, beautiful Tim and you did allude to um, to a, a story, um, something that happened to you where uh, you maybe got away by the skin of your teeth. Um, can you share that story with us? Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. And I, I actually, it's it's a strange thing. I I I, I certainly don't mind. It was frightening. Um, you know, you usually want to stick with the fun and uh, humorous stuff, but you do this long enough, and you have too, uh, Justin, been at it a long time. And um, I always find this interesting to talk about because it's a great reminder that things can go very wrong. As much fun as you're having on a given day, as you well know, you're slipping along on a river and, you know, it is water and it is moving water and, um, you know, one mistake can be a very, very serious situation. So we were, I was actually floating one of the small streams up here and it was springtime and that unto itself can can be challenging under certain conditions. The water is big and it's usually cooking with with a little, you know, swollen from a little bit of runoff. And um, you can float the river one day and it can be very passable with no sweepers and no obstructions. And you can come around the corner two days later thinking, all right, it's all clear. And something has changed. And uh, I never forget that, but I was, I was, you know, we, we had come around this corner. I had, I had floated the same small stream three times and it was clear and uh you know everything was per perfectly passable and uh sure enough i'm with some old guests and they love to do it and the fishing is usually very fair and the fish are small but that doesn't matter it's as much about the experience you know what i mean uh we came around the corner and on the same float and there was a cougar with his head into the body cavity of a white-tailed deer that it had just killed and yeah just some wild stuff right so but we're we're there's a particular bank that always holds a few fish and i'm pulling back hard and i'm just watching evie's fly you know tight to the bank and waiting 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 right hang in there evie hang in there and water's cooking and all of a sudden evie i hear evie say something and it doesn't really register but she said watch out for this tree and she says it again and i'm i'm kind of paying attention justin but i'm more excited because this bank always holds fish and i'm watching her fly and by the time she turns around and really hollers at me, Timmy, watch out for this tree. We're basically on it. And it was a new sweeper, and it was two-thirds the way across the river. And at this point, there really isn't much I can do, Justin. And she lands in my lap. Uh, the bow of the boat starts to ride up. And I'm thinking for the first time in my life, that's it. You've, oh, God. You've, yeah, you, you, you know, you were stupid, Linehan. You, 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 this, is, this is exactly what you don't do. And you know, wasn't paying attention and et cetera, et cetera. The bow of the boat rides up, right? And now we're at a pretty steep angle and she's in my lap and there's nothing I can do. Fortunately, that sweeper had some spring in it and we got up, I'm guessing we're 35, 40 degrees. The boat's ready to flip, Justin. Um, her husband's screaming, you know, hollering in the back. Uh, you know, and nobody really knows what to do. Oars fly out. Uh, but there was spring in the sweeper, bow of the boat bounces under, we fly under, rods get lost, gears flying everywhere. Uh, we're cooking through this fast shoot. Um, long story short, I manage with one oar to get through the chute and 
you know, down around the corner and, you know, grab some stuff that's floating by and everybody takes a moment. But, you know, as I said, I, I kind of, it's, the, it's one of the first and only times where I really made a very, very serious and bad mistake by not looking ahead and not being ready and paying too much attention on a stupid fly on the bank during conditions that were, you know, that, that, that were that I should have known better. I mean, they're all on me, Justin, all on me. I should have known better than to, than to be, you know, complacent about the river being clean during runoff every single day, even though I had fished it two days prior and it was clean, you know what I mean? So it was a great lesson. And um, as I said, I, I, I sure don't mind telling it because it's another reminder for myself that, that things can go very, very wrong in a matter of seconds when you're on a you know, when you're on moving water, when you're on any water, when you're in the woods, you know, like like the, the woods and the water, like the wilderness, you may, or like the ocean, you know, you make a mistake, it, it, it can be pretty serious in a moment. So anyway, but all, all turned out well, and we actually finished the day on the spare oar stayed in the boat, which was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, well, thank you for sharing that story. We've all, uh, we've all had our close calls and, uh, yeah. and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it, uh, the dice rolled your way. Right, um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Tim, for taking the time to chat with us. It was really good to catch up with you. And um, we'll, uh, we'll see, uh, see you guys around the bend here. Go to thefebruaryroom.com where you can access a complete library of our podcast and read more about our guests, their fishing stories, and favorite fly patterns. We're always looking for exceptional fly fishing yarns. And if you have one to spin, shoot us an email at info at the February room .com. The February Room is always free, but if you feel like throwing a nickel in the pond, we appreciate any additional listener support. For companies and individuals interested in sponsorship opportunities, please contact us for our media kit. Thanks for stopping by the February Room, and we'll see you down here next week.